Okay, the live stream is ready. All I have to do is hit the record button. Great, Joe is logging on now. So just a minute and then we'll be ready to go. Okay, the live stream is ready. All I have to do is hit the record button. Oh no. Great, Joe is logging on now. So just a minute and then we'll be ready to go. I'm a little concerned about what's happening. I, if I put up my sound so that I can hear, I it's delayed a little bit on the on the stream. So it. Oh. Carol? Yes. Um, I was just trying to message you, but I think that if the live stream is a problem, just forget it and we'll just record it and then. Well, I, post um, it. it looks like it's, it looks like it's on at the top of the screen there and I closed out of it on my computer. So maybe that was the problem. Okay. So hopefully it's still doing what it should be doing. Okay. So just let me know when you're ready to hit the record button. Okay. All right, why don't we get started? Okay. Do you have a flag? I do. Excellent. We're all set. Okay. All right, welcome everybody to the Thursday, July 30th, 2020 meeting of the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School Committee. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, of the United States, States America of America and to the republic, to the republic for, which it stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> um, we're going to keep everybody muted. There are a lot of people on this call. Um, school committee members, if we need to take any sort of vote, which is unexpected. I don't expect to, but if we do, you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, and then there will be public comment at the end where we will recognize people to then unmute themselves and speak, or we'll have to unmute and speak depending on the settings. But everybody's gonna be muted through this presentation, please. Um, all right, uh, our item of business tonight is a preliminary, preliminary plan for reopening of school, Carol Woodbury and Ken Jenks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're just, I'm gonna just uh, start sharing my screen so that you can see the plan or actually the PowerPoint about the plan. So um, one of the things that I just wanna kind of point out at the outside set before we get started with the plan, um, people, most people realize that we have um, many unions that we work with within the school district. And um, some of the things that uh, we might be talking about tonight do require a change in what we call working conditions, which is a subject of mandatory bargaining. So there may be some times that you have some questions about something that I won't really be able to answer because it is a subject of mandatory bargaining. And we'll have to um, work with our 
uh, employee unions uh, throughout this process to um, get answers to those kinds of things because it has to be some agreement between the school committee and the uh, employee unions. I just wanted to point that out at the beginning so that people would understand. Thank you. Um, as you know, we uh, have a reopening task force with administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, parents. Uh, we've had four meetings. We had one this morning. Uh, we have two more scheduled for this upcoming week before we have to submit our final plan. Uh, we did do a survey at the end of the school year and, um, and got some, uh, have recently sent out both an employee survey and a uh, parent family survey to um, our uh, folks to get their input for uh, what they are thinking about for September. Uh, as you know, we have to submit a draft plan tomorrow, an initial plan. It really just asks us a little bit about what we found out uh, during this, this time that we've been studying these various ideas. And we will submit that tomorrow. It doesn't require a school committee vote tonight, but next week the school committee will vote on the final plan. The goal of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education from the beginning has been to safely return as many students as possible to um, in-person settings to maximize learning and to address students' holistic needs. So one of the guidance documents that came out from the department was entitled Remote Learning Guidance. And they seem a little contradictory. Uh, when you talk about remote learning guidance, you're thinking of students not being in person. Uh, so why did they call it that? Well, because they know that there will be, um, even if we do open up in person, there will be um, some need for some students who will not be able to attend school in person for a variety of reasons. We may have a um, situation where we can't fit all of our students in safely following, uh, following all of the health and safety guidelines. So we may have to have a hybrid learning model, which will require some of our students to come to school on some days and other students to come on other days. The other piece of this is that we have to be prepared and we have to be flexible to be able to move whenever um, the conditions around COVID change. We remind people all the time that this all is happening because we are uh, in a serious health and safety situation. And therefore we have to plan for remote learning so that we don't get caught short like we did last spring with suddenly the schools being closed and no plan for what to do about our students' education. Very important. This uh, chart was part of the reopening guidance uh, that came out last Friday, the, 20, the 24th. And um, as you can see, we would love to be in the green returning uh, to school with no restrictions and this all being over. But that's not likely to happen before uh, we would typically start school for September. So in the first um, category, we have in-person learning with new safety requirements and we have to have protocols in place to meet all the health and safety requirements as outlined by the CDC and the Department of Public Health and local departments of health. Um, However, even when you're open uh, in person, uh, there will be some students whose families may choose to have full-time remote. We may have students who um, become symptomatic and they will have to need a short-term remote option during their period of isolation. It could also be that our students are asymptomatic, but that they um, come in contact with someone in their family, uh, somewhere in the community, and they need to be home for a short period of time for isolation. The hybrid model is one that I um, mentioned earlier uh, in that case, um, and it will probably uh, be the case for our high school students, uh, at least some of them, because we are, as we're studying how many students we can fit in the rooms with our appropriate um, physical distancing, uh, we are going to have to utilize some smaller class sizes to make sure that everyone is safe. So again, this, those same kind of scenarios, some students may uh, also, um, even on the days that they would be remote, they may have to be home for a variety of reasons or they may select being home. Finally, 
Uh, the third option, the fully remote option, where learning takes place only remotely, could be required due to school closures if um, the COVID conditions uh, change and become more severe. So as you can see from the bullets, again, we're focused not only on the physical health of our students, their safety and nutrition, but also on the social, emotional, and the mental health needs of our uh, students in our community. Equity has to be a top concern in local planning. This crisis uh, we have found from um, all of the study that has been done so far, disproportionately affects some of our most vulnerable students in terms of their physical and mental health and academically. That has to be a focus of our planning. And finally, um, as you can see, maintaining connections between school staff and students and families is certainly very important and it will help us in addressing all of our students' needs. Finally, at the bottom of the slide, there's a, um, a quote from one of the guidance documents about what is they're calling special populations that need some special considerations because of the kind of services that they require and the accommodations that they require in their, in their education. One of the things that we have heard consistently from the commissioner is that we have to work very hard to strengthen the remote learning experience. Um, as everyone knows, we really had to pivot very quickly back in the spring. And the commissioner has made it clear that some of the things that we did in the spring while they were uh, appropriate for the time and for the amount of time that we had for planning and what we had to do, they were acceptable. There will be many more um, guidelines, shall we say, to making sure that the remote learning program is strengthened if a child's family prefers that type of instruction. So we parents and caregivers do have the option to choose the district's remote learning plan for their child's instruction if they prefer. We have to plan for staff in both settings. And one of the things that we'll be asking the school committee for next week is a some kind of a policy decision on how long they think uh, they could give us if students start their year remotely and then decide that maybe conditions have changed and they want to send their child back to school. Uh, we need a reasonable transition period because we may still be in the situation where we have to follow certain health and safety uh, guidelines, and we might not be able to include other children that we haven't planned for very quickly. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is recommending no more than three to four weeks for a transition. And certainly if we could do it quicker, that would be the, the ideal situation. Some of the things around strengthening the remote learning uh, experience uh, are related to the things that you see here on the slide. Um, in the spring, we weren't really taking attendance, although our teachers did take attendance. Uh, it was a goal of ours to um, pay attention to all the students that were engaged with learning so that we could make sure that uh, people were engaging. But we know that in some cases, uh, we had children and families that weren't engaging with the learning. But this time, we're going to be required to take attendance. I put some definitions up here because I know that you hear these maybe even in the news, uh, but sometimes people don't really understand what you're talking about. When we're talking about synchronous learning, we're talking about learning that takes place in which a whole group of students are engaged in the learning at the same time, as opposed to asynchronous learning, which means that the students are learning the same material, but they may be in different times and locations for doing that. Another area of strengthening is the districts have to assess all their students based on the districts and um, the educators performance criteria that they would typically use if their students were with them at school. So we will have to give grades and we will have to do assessments and um, those will have to be reported. Um, and this, as you can see from the final bullet, it doesn't matter whether they're in person in hybrid or doing remote learning environments, there will be grading. 
Another important piece is that we will be responsible for all of the students' learning standards. They have to have access to the grade level instruction in all the content areas that are incur included in the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. As far as it stands right now, there will still be MCAS tests in 2021. We know that, that depending on what happens, the commissioner could um, speak with his board and that could change. But as it stands right now, we should be preparing students for the learning that should take place in the grade level that they are attending. Uh, students learning remotely should have those same opportunities to engage in enrichment opportunities and intervention supports as they are needed. There has to be a comprehensive plan for delivering our special education services, both in person as we would if uh, we were all in school and also those as services remotely. Uh, the remote learning option uh, must be available for individual students who are not returning in person, as well as students attending in person in the event of a future classroom or school closure due to the COVID-19 situation. I'm going to turn it over to Ken Jinks for a few minutes to talk about some of the uh, operational decisions that are being made. Good evening. Uh, in terms of what does it take to put this into practice, as you might imagine, there's probably been literally hundreds of pages of advisories and guidance from the CDC and the DESE and various agencies. And in this case, we're glad to have that because you can't have 351 different school systems adopting all kinds of policies and procedures that aren't aligned with state and local board of health pieces. So where are we going? and where are, what are we buying, if you will, and what are we preparing for, is usually, again, based on guidance and discussions with our local uh, board of health partners, and it's been great. Cleaning and disinfecting, the first thing on everybody's minds, our vendors, Partner Solutions, the cleaning company, if you will, uh, they've given us documentation of the training for all of their people. Disinfectant, EPA approved products, we don't use products that are not EPA approved, the cleaning, and yet even running some small scale programs this summer, we realized some gaps, which it's been great in a sense for us to go up, oh, need a little more training, need certain more supplies in some spaces. But we'll be confident that when people are returning, there's cleaning and disinfecting. It's very labor intensive, as you might imagine. And once students are in the building, it'll be even more so, and we're working out schedules and rotations to make sure we can accomplish that. So they won't have to be concerned. It's like, oh, are they going to go to school and it's not going to be healthy? It'll be healthy. The six foot rule limit has some real practical implications when you look at classrooms. The vast majority of classrooms in our schools can hold eight to 12 desks. And if you consider the enrollment in each building, it's a little bit different, the story that takes place. But that's really one of the biggest logistical factors limiting what you can and can't do in a school because you have to have that six foot difference, uh, distance. <clears throat> right now, it looks promising in most of our buildings that we're able to offer on-site learning in most grades for those who want it. And then we can talk a little bit more about the practical limitations later, including busing. Uh, cohorts simply means a standard group of students. You know, if the state says, put a group of students together, a dozen students, they're your cohort. Whenever possible, and the state wants to emphasize, that means just about everywhere it's possible. That same group should stay together. And they shouldn't have a lot of contact with other cohorts. Because what you're trying to do, of course, is limit contact and limit transmission. And that has impacts for bus scheduling, how you schedule students in classes and in schools, particularly in the older grades where that traditional model involved going and mixing and matching in different classes. So we'll be working through that. Principals and their teams have really taken that task up and are working there. Assigned seats everywhere. That's something people are gonna have to adjust to. Uh, and for some people that will seem like a big change for others like, oh, come on, please, really? but that keeps on going back to contact tracing. As a district, we're the proud owners of 72,000 face masks, 3,500 face shields, 
untold gallons of sanitizer, usually in gallon dispensers with pumps for classrooms and offices. We actually will have so much at any given time, we will have to work with the fire departments about flammable materials and where we're storing it spread out throughout the district. Sanitizer stations will be on common points where large numbers of people may be passing in a relatively short time. So all of those pieces are in play for PPE. and We can go on in greater detail. And finally, maximized ventilation. We know across the state, everybody thinks about, okay, all these old public buildings and schools, the uni vents, if you will. What about the airflow? How many microns in those filters? We're putting together documentation with our energy management subcontractor. And since March, we've been able to, we've purchased all new filters. We've cleaned the systems. In a sense, being away from school allowed all the systems to be tuned. We're working about the windows, which ones don't quite open or are stuck. So we can maximize that ventilation. And so hopefully those logistical nuts and bolts things will uh, allow us to have a high level of confidence for people. So they'll say, sure, I'm comfortable sending my student or the teachers or the staff and they can come into the buildings and have education that's building based. So those are some of the nuts and bolts we're working through. In terms of our district itself, families, we can't make this work without the family cooperation to be candid, the physical distancing. You may be aware that in other countries, the World Health Organization has published numerous studies that say three foot distancing with masks is pretty much as effective as the six foot distancing. Uh, did not catch on in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or in many places in the States, the way some of the people had anticipated. I mean, there is science behind it but almost every school system is committed and we are as well, Dennis Shamath to, you know, everybody's been trained up, if you will, in that six foot distancing and wearing your mask. And so those two things alone, and you add washing hands, will make it all work. So we're staying with the physical distancing, mask and face coverings, everybody wears a face covering. Those things, and there are some exceptions for speci uh, special situations, but overall, Everybody will feel safer if the idea is all students are wearing masks. You can have mask breaks and there's procedures for that, but that's a, a standard expectation that we believe would keep us safe. Hand washing and hand sanitizing, enough said. The, the more that happens during the day, perhaps the better. And in a way for people who are used to getting attendance letters from us saying, why didn't your child come to school today? This year, it's a slightly different situation. It's like, if you have any questions or doubts about your child feeling well, stay home, keep the child home. The same for adults. And so those core four rules, if you will, will go a long way to making sure we can operate, have students and staff in schools, but protect everybody as well. In, in terms of this slide, those buildings made that mention before, K through seven, we feel pretty comfortable that we could get pretty much everybody in with that six foot distancing. Although the superintendent and I are meeting with all the principals for some final checks and discussions, uh, tomorrow actually and uh, Monday, and the furniture is being set up. We'll put pictures on the website and. Uh, some places we even talked about maybe doing a little bit of a video showing here's a group of people riding the bus, going to school. This is what that would look like. The good news again, K through seven, we have the capacity to make on-site work. Preschool in grades eight through 12, the high school, really is going to need that hybrid model at first. And it's really about the, the physical realities of the space. Many of those high school classrooms can only do eight desks in the location. It's the nature of the building, the size of the desk. And also think of the high school and scheduling in cohorts, trying to keep kids together, populations. One of the unique elements of the Massachusetts plan is that statement there, 
we want to make sure that students who might be on an alternating day schedule, but there are vulnerable students, perhaps some specialized circumstances or learning needs, or students who were not connected in, in the sense, we lost track of them last spring, felt like they disappeared, making every effort to say they can be in school every day. And the superintendent had made sort of that remote in place reference. And that's one way to accomplish some of that, as well as saying, let's make sure those students are here, even if you're the, doing an alternating hybrid, to make sure we don't lose so much ground uh, that it's really a hard to recover situation. And the opportunities, everybody's been incredibly creative. It's amazing as we work through groups with the advisory group and hearing ideas from parents, staff members, the, the administrators, putting options together. So when uh, the superintendent covers that survey, we can say, honestly, we've heard from our constituencies and we can honor the needs of all those different constituencies, depending on, do they want on-site? Do they want a hybrid? Or they do what they want to be all remote at home right now. And so considering the circumstances, I think we're in a good place to be ready for mid-September. Thank you, Ken. So um, I think you all probably know that we have uh, the two surveys out, one for um, teachers and staff. Uh, this slide shows just teachers only. And the, the big number is the uh, number of people in each category. So, so far we've heard from 160 people who say they're able to return to work out of the 213 responses. About two thirds of our teaching force has responded so far. Uh, 41 uh, people say they're either, when we say high risk, it's either themselves or someone that they're living with. One of the things that will likely happen is that uh, eventually um, our HR department will have conversations individually with each person to assess uh, what their readiness for work is and uh, other pieces that we might need. The other was um, really people who maybe they fit in the category of being able to return to work, but maybe they have a child at home or that um, they're not sure they're gonna be able to get childcare for, or maybe they have um, children that go to school in a different um, community. They're trying to figure out if their community is gonna be on a similar work schedule. You know, the Cape and Islands uh, superintendents are trying very hard to work together, but we all have really a lot of our own uniquenesses to our school districts. And so, we're trying to make it work. We actually had another conversation about the um, students that belong to teachers. So let's say for example, um, there's a teacher in one of our Dennis Yarmouth schools that happens to live in Barnstable. So they have children that go to school in Barnstable. Is there any possibility that the children that go to school over in Barnstable that belong to a, te a Dennis Yarmouth teacher could go to school five days a week instead of if, they're, if they happen to be in a hybrid model, is there a way we can work through that? It's not to give preferential treatment, but just like all of you, if, if you're trying to go back to work and you don't have childcare, it does make it a little bit challenging because you really just can't leave those little people all by themselves. Um, so <clears throat> um, we are trying to work through a lot of that stuff together, but it, it's a really, I have to admit, it's a very challenging um, situation. So I will say about the surveys, <clears throat> this was as of yesterday at four o'clock. So if you know people who haven't answered the survey yet, you know, we're not gonna hold people to all of this. We're gonna have those individual conversations as we go through, but if people could let us know what they're thinking about both parents and um, employees, that would be very helpful to us as we're trying to navigate uh, the plans. Uh, in our survey results of the uh, pre-K to seven group, we see that we have um, 153 or 20% of those who responded saying that they would prefer 100% remote. Um, we have um, 362 who say that uh, they would prefer in person. And then we have still a large number, 262 that are undecided. And we understand the undecided. There are many reasons to be undecided. Well, we haven't given our parents enough information yet about what it's really going to look like. 
and and as Mr. Jenks said mentioned earlier, we're going to try to do some of that through videos and other kinds of things that we'll send out and certainly post to our website. So you can see what a classroom is going to look like. You can hear more about some of the kinds of things that we're, that we're planning on doing. And for a district that has about 3000 kids, of course you remember some of a thousand of them are at the high school. Uh, so this doesn't look like uh, very good numbers yet, but we hoping that you will tell your friends to please answer the survey because it will be really helpful to us. And you can feel free to share with them uh, what you heard tonight, that would be very helpful as well. And if people have questions, you know, uh, our email works great. Uh, there's a lot of it right now, so we will get to you as quickly as we can, but there's an email address that we put on the survey that if you had specific questions, you could please pose them. We're gonna take them, you know, every few days and try to answer as many as we can. This was the uh, eight through 12 uh, survey. And again, you can see that we had 18% uh, or 70 students for remote, uh, 152 in person, 87 for the hybrid model, and uh, still 80 undecided. And again, that's probably less than a third of the high school population. So again, we really, we really need more, more data and uh, so we hope that the word will get out there that this is really important. <clears throat> I'll be sending another text message to remind everybody about it. One of the things that um, we're also going to be required to do is um, give a few more family supports than we were able to give last spring. Part of it was um, just trying to figure out exactly what we were doing internally. But one of the things that we've heard from parents pretty consistently is that once they learn how to use a certain platform, it's helpful if we don't change that platform. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, one of the platforms that we used with preschool to grade two last spring was the Seesaw platform. It was pretty popular. Um, it seems to be able to do what we need it to do. So we have adopted that for the upcoming year. And in grades three to, through 12, we were using Google Classroom and we will stick with that. One of the things that we will do is perhaps offer a, a virtual training for families, uh, something that can be recorded so that if you're not using it right away, you can go back and go to the recording and, and, and hear it again so that you can say, oh, what did they say about that? Oh, okay, that, that would be helpful. I'll go back to that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I need a little drink of water, sorry. <clears throat> um, the other thing is a lot of our um, families, of course, are younger and uh, than certainly myself, uh, and you're used to using technology, but sometimes uh, there's still some people who really could use some help on uh, how to work those iPads and things like that. So these are all the kinds of things that we're thinking about doing guides and information and videos that might be available online for you to access. Um, just some specific hardware and networking issues. It seemed from the survey that we did in the spring that one of the major uh, barriers was the hardware. If uh, parents were working from home and they only had one device in the home or they only owned a phone, uh, that was a big problem. And especially if it was uh, that they were trying to work from home, even if they had a desktop computer. So uh, what we've done is we have made sure that we have ordered um, iPads uh, for our youngest students, which was the, the group that really didn't have that much support with the technology. Uh, so in pre-K through grade two, we've ordered iPads. You know, we're in the ordering queue, as Mr. Jenks will tell you, even with the masks, we were so, I mean, never think about getting so excited when a whole bunch of masks or hand sanitizer shows up on your doorstep, but you really do. And um, we will be equally excited when the iPads show up so we can get, our technology department can get those ready. We can't promise them for the very first day of school, but we know that we need to get that out as quickly as possible. We did make the order a while ago, so, but we're in line with a lot of other people who are all trying to do the same kinds of things that we're doing. 
Also, sometimes just the individual curriculum or the content is something that parents might need some support with. Um, understanding how their children are receiving their assignments and getting the feedback and things like that. Uh, so all of those things will be things that we'll be trying to work with parents, whether again, as their virtual meetings or things that we can do to put online. Uh, we also know that it was very helpful from what we heard from parents for the engagement um, between teachers and interacting with um, their their teachers and also with the students. We have to think a lot about the accommodations for our students with disabilities and access to services uh, for our English language learners. <clears throat> so that is, oh, there we go, I'm sorry. So we also are thinking a lot about the, some of the similar kinds of things for training for our staff. Uh, certainly, there is a lot to think about in the area of health and safety. We will have to do some staff training in a lot of different areas related to that. Uh, some of our teachers may not have used Seesaw last spring because we had a few different ones that were going uh, for the younger grades. Some people uh, had been familiar with Google Classroom but didn't have the in-depth knowledge. So those are all things that we have to work with with our teachers. Certainly our technology tools and most importantly, more importantly than anything else, effective remote learning practices. You know, we did it on the fly. We did the best we could. People were working really hard to try to learn new things, but it was a challenge. And so we have some folks right now, some of our coaches, that are taking some trainings and they will be able to become sort of what we call train the trainer and work with other teachers who weren't a part of some of those summer trainings to um, learn some new ways of, do, of effective practices for remote learning. Most of our families know a lot about our Dolphin Way, our positive behavioral interventions and supports. You know that the underlying philosophy behind that is that student, if students knew what we expected of them, they would do it. And so sometimes if they aren't meeting our expectations, it's our job as an educational institution to teach them what we're asking them to do. We're going to have a lot of new things that we need to think about. In the past, we thought about how do you go to lunch in the cafeteria? How do you go to recess? How do you go down that slide in a safe way? Now we're going to have to build a culture of mask wearing. We're going to have to build a culture of hand washing even more so than ever before. And so our, uh, our PBIS teams will be coming together to help develop some things. Some of the things that have been super effective for us in the past is that they've developed some videos and things that we've shared with our students in the classroom. We also know that um, one of the things that will help our students is if they learn how to use their iPads on these different management systems while they're in the classroom, if they're in, in person. Um, just because we had Google Classroom doesn't mean that every classroom was using it. And so we need to take some time while we're in school with our kids to teach them some of those things, even for the kids that need that are in person, because if we do have an outbreak of COVID in our area or something and we need to go home, our students need to be familiar with it. At the same time, that has to be very much balanced with screen time. We know that a lot of screen time, especially for our youngest learners and really for all of our kids for that matter, is not, is not the best. So all of those things will I'll be talking about and um, thinking about balancing. So on to um, content and assessment. Uh, I know that, um, I think Carol Eichner is here on the call. She's our director of early learning. And in our pre-K area, we use um, two um, curriculum pieces called Teaching Strategies Gold and Creative Curriculum. Carol, are you able to un unmute yourself and tell us just a couple of things about that? Well, hi. Um... I guess what I'd like people to know is that this is not new for our teachers, um, but uh, we believe, and I'm going to be getting more information about this, that like many of the really rich curriculum resources that are out there, they are working hard to make sure that there are online components to it. What I think is really attractive about the possibility with Teaching Strategies Gold slash creative curriculum, I think it's one big company actually, um, is that we've used them for assessment measures in the past. And that was one of our greatest challenges um, 
is that how will we even know how these kids are really moving if we're not going to see them as often. So that I'm very excited about it. I'm going to get more information next week. I'm going to attend their webinar. All right. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, Lila Maxwell is our director of STEM instruction, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. So Lila, would you talk about the math and science curriculum? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the Great Minds in Sync uh, comes from um, Great Minds, where it is in um, tandem with our Eureka math resource that we use with for, uh, throughout the uh, district. And we started uh, using um, Great Minds videos during uh, the closure last spring. Uh, the feedback that we got from teachers was it was very supportive to continue the learning at home. Um, I do know that, you know, as, as uh, the parents were using it, it, it was a little bit difficult, but um, uh, most people got in the, the routine of it. So we decided to continue with that. They are offering it um, with an additional add-on, which I think is going to be very helpful. You know, we're all very concerned about uh, the, um, the uh, learning that um, might not have uh, stayed with the student uh, over this period of time. So within this platform, there will be many assessments uh, that teachers may um, administer to the students before each module. So it's a pre-assessment to see where the students stand in terms of the necessary skills and knowledge that they need to move on in the grade level curriculum. So um, that I think will be very supportive for teachers and uh, students. And it's not just assessing, it's seeing the results and being able to um, have the resources to support those students to get up to speed in those standards before they can move on. So we really want to keep students moving forward um, and uh, hopefully this will uh, let us uh, do that in an efficient manner. Um, the science resources uh, that we're putting uh, into play, we were researching new science resources before this um, closure took place. So um, we were looking at what's called STEM scopes. It just happens to be a digital platform. This will really uh, allow us to um, have that seamless uh, capability of having a consistent curriculum, whether you're in school or whether you're remote. So um, this uh, was reviewed by teachers and myself and the science coach. It, did, it was at the top of our list. So this is a very good time to start the implementation. Thank you, Lila. Um, so now I'll call upon uh, Sherry Santini, who is the Director of Humanities and the Arts to talk about li literacy and social studies. Thank you, Mrs. Woodbury. Um, so as many of you are familiar with, um, our K-5 teachers implemented the Literacy Collaborative Framework of Instruction um, for Literacy. We implement um, that framework with reading, writing instruction. Um, it was challenging in the spring when we had to go to remote instruction, especially for our guided reading uh, because don't have access to your books. When Founders and Pinnell released the text to us, the interactive read alouds and the guided reading books as PDFs, um, our coaches got pretty creative with that and discovered if they took screenshots of the books, they could embed them into um, screencasts and then push it out to students through Seesaw in the lower grades and Google Classroom in grades three, four, and five. And they could create um, a facsimile of a guided reading group. So you could have your book introduction. Uh, you could push the books out where the kids could then read aloud to you within a Zoom session. So you could still hear them read, hear their fluency, um, get some of their reading behaviors that what you would do in a guided reading group and you could have your book discussions. We had some teachers that started to pr um, practice with that a bit um, and that's our goal to create that uh, environment in a larger scale with our K to five teachers. So we had a taste of that um, in the spring and that was really great practice. 
So it's just a matter of getting the books now, everything into that um, technical space on our Google Drives so that they can push those out. Same thing with our interactive read alouds. But we don't, we don't wanna have to step backwards into um, that old school uh, mentality of the way reading and writing instruction was once done. We've come, our teachers have come so far with our students into what's best practice with literacy instruction. So the coaches were instrumental in finding uh, new and innovative ways to take the content and best practice of instruction that we've been working so hard at, at and flipping it into a remote model. Um, so we're gonna do the same, looking at how we can do that with our writing instruction. We know that we've discovered with Seesaw, for example, that there are ways that students can collaborate with one another and share their work. Teachers are able to give feedback to um, their students in their writing because we know that was a challenge that was identified during the spring. Um, being able to have the student share their writing with the teacher and the teacher to give feedback and make that a two-way process, much like you would do in the classroom. So those are things that we identified as areas of concern in the spring they've been able to address through the Seesaw platform and then through the PD that will continue with begin in the fall and then continue throughout the course of the school year to continue to address those concerns. For social studies, um, that we had started off um, in the school year working with a team of um, teachers in taking the 2018 newly adopted framework and standards to start to pace them out for teachers. And then when the pandemic hit, we were just in that part of getting ready to take all of the standards and create those scope and pacing guides. Um, so that work will continue, whether it's as a team or um, on a more uh, one man island kind of a thing. But what we do know is that we've got some great resources through Nuzella. They have curated um, online resources that'll be available, whether you're in school, in-person learning or remote, that students will have access through an, an app on their iPads. And what's the great thing about Nuzella that all of our students grades um, three through seven have access to is that the text is available at, at a variety of Lexile levels. So without losing the content and the rigor of the material, students can access it at their reading level. And then you can have great class discussions around the same content without students feeling frustrated that they can't access the material. And then it has built in assessments teachers can track a student's progress with that. So that's also um, something that we are, the district has um, purchased licenses for so that teachers can continue to use that with their students in social studies. Um, and so that's well, that's work that we're continuing with the, the um, social studies curriculum for next year. Thank you. Um, the other thing that um, the commissioner has made clear is we did not have, as everyone knows, the MCAS exams last spring. Uh, and uh, in a conversation that he had with superintendents, he asked us, well, don't you, you in the fall, you usually assess your students as they're coming in to see how they're, how they're holding up and how they did uh, over the summer and did they hold the learning. And we all agreed that we in fact did do that and so he would like to see as part of our plan what kind of an assessment tool we're going to use. Now this doesn't mean that the first day that the kids walk through the door that we're going to start doing assessments. Uh, one of the things that's not on this list and uh, it really wasn't uh, intended to be an oversight but when we met with our task force this morning they reminded me uh, of the uh, very important component of social emotional learning. By the time our kids come back to us, uh, they will have been gone for a pretty long time. And, um, you know, there's a lot that um, has happened. And um, we know that there's a, you know, just for us as adults, there's a certain amount of trauma and everything that's taken place. So we're not, it's not that we're not interested in learning. We absolutely are interested in learning and we're going to get down to it. And you can handle social emotional learning while you're attending to academics. However, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us until uh, the new teacher gets to know the new students and um, welcomes them into the classroom and, and starts working with them a little bit that we um, just say, oh, welcome to school, here's a test. Uh, that's not really our, the way we do things around here. So we will be assessing our students. We have adopted a particular 
assessment tool uh, to help us with that. But the social emotional learning of our students is extremely important. And one other thing in terms of professional development is um, the time to uh, work for teachers to work together by either content areas or grade level, uh, what we call professional learning communities to plan out uh, lessons and those kinds of things. I would say that probably, even though it was behind the scenes and probably a lot of parents didn't really realize what was going on, one of the most important pieces of what happened last spring was the opportunity for our, our teachers uh, to work together to plan lesson plans and, and do things together. You know, we have, everybody knows we have three pre-K to three schools. And um, for the first time ever, we were really able to have all of our first grade teachers, no matter what school they worked in, working together on the literacy and making sure that we were keeping our curriculum um, tied together at those, at those grade levels. So that's something that came out of this that we really want to continue to do and we're going to uh, be working to try to find some ways to do that. So it's a lot to accomplish. And for those of us, for, for those of you who may be on the, on the uh, call, to, uh, on the Zoom meeting today, who are paraprofessionals in our, in our school district, uh, the work that you do with us is very important too. And so uh, the, some of the professional development, we certainly will be providing for our paraprofessionals too. They play an important role in our district. Uh, you may have heard in the news recently um, that the commissioner has agreed with the state teachers union on a 170 day student year this year. Typically our student year is 180 days. He realizes that um, the planning for the beginning of the year is really critically important to our long-term success with these plans. And so he has signed an agreement with the uh, unions for 10 days uh, for teacher PD and planning prior to the start with students. Uh, as long as we start the student year no later than September 16th. So that will be another thing that next week uh, with the school committee uh, we will be talking uh, with them. Uh, the school committee is in charge of the school district's calendar. So we will be talking with them about how we adjust our calendar. The 10 days are not optional. We can't bank days and use them some other time. They have to be uh, used prior to the start of the school year. And we have to do them. I mean, teachers have to work, people have to work. We have to do the work that's necessary. So that's part of how we will accomplish all of the things that we were talking about on the prior slide. So school-based operations. We're talking in a lot of generalities, I realize, about district, big district ideas. But just like every school year, um, you know, as superintendent, I don't micromanage how the Station Avenue kids get off the bus or walk down the halls or things like that. There are a lot of pieces, these school-based operational factors that you see on the screen that are important for our principals and they have been working with their teams to try to identify how it's all going to happen. It's a heavy lift but uh, they're very excited about the work that they're doing and they're really thinking together. There's a lot of group think going on, lots of meetings and figuring out how we're going to manage. We've been listening to the people on our task force. Uh, we've been, they've been meeting and giving advice in smaller school groups as well. And that's been extremely helpful. Um, we have to have a space um, in our schools that would be a little uh, quarantine space in case there's somebody who gets, who's feeling ill while they're at school. It has to be away from and not in the same place where you would go to get a Band-Aid. So we have a wonderful uh, district nurse uh, leader. Her name is Kristen Dwyer. She's been working with us and thanks to her efforts and the efforts of a lot of other people, we've been able to open some small but very successful so far, a uh, summer care program and um, an extended school year program for our students with um, some IEP needs. And I just wanna commend all of those folks because uh, it's been pretty hot and um, people have done an amazing job. 
And it also has given us the opportunity to try out some of the um, things that we will have to do in the fall. So on a very limited basis, the arrival and dismissal of students as they've been coming to these programs every day, having a space that's away from the uh, other spaces uh, to go get a Band-Aid, uh, talking about social emotional supports, thinking through how do we have our meals at school? How do we access water? We're not allowed to use water fountains. We have kids with water bottles. So a lot is going on behind the scenes that are things that are related to school-based operations and um, our principals are ready. And when they uh, talk with their parents, it'll be the same thing as always. They will tell you about the individual school operations. And I think you'll be pleased with the work that they're doing. I'm gonna turn it back to Ken Jenks um, to talk a little bit about buses. Yes, one of my favorite topics. <clears throat> and the practical reality, it's very interesting because the first few weeks when pronouncements were coming out from various and sundry groups about, oh, what you should try in schools, <clears throat> the practical question that kept on creep cropping up was, so how do you get them there? And if you have to maintain distancing, how you get them there? And so the practical problem becomes that 71 passenger bus, for instance. Dennis Yarmouth, we usually use 32 of them. During the course of a year, we transport our 14 or 1500 students who might ride the buses on a given day to school and to other places after school, plus the late bus runs and all that. <laughs> well, the rules are different now. And using our 32 buses, we can transport 736 students at a given time. So you first hear that and you go, oh my gosh. Now the upside, we have a multi-tier bus system. And the practical piece is to, to put the challenge differently. Uh, those of you who have had students riding the buses or follow this, we have three tiers, you know, and there's sort of the high school run if you will, is the first in the morning. Then there's a group of buses that are doing the middle school and the intermediate school, Wixon and Mattakees. And then there's another wave of buses that are doing the elementaries. Well, if you, you look at the numbers, K through three, it's about 880 students. Okay, that's not that far from 736. The real challenge is the four, five, six, seven. There's about 960 students. Not insurmountable because we know not all students ride the buses and so on. And many of our parents are saying in the surveys. And at the high school, there's about, say, 900 students. The task will be manageable. And we're lucky because there are many places that it's not manageable and they're going, oh my gosh, you can't just add buses. Uh, average age of a bus driver in Massachusetts is probably over 60 something. So it's a high risk group. So people are worried about having enough drivers. We're working with the bus company on the routes, talking about getting the kids to school. I'm confident we can do it. They'll be disinfecting at the end and there's uh, between runs and we're taking care of business. So we'll work through the bus trouble, the problem. The issue is not everybody lives where we want them to live. So it may adjust the times of school a little bit staggering or one bus. In terms of overall transportation, what's it like on the buses? Again, you can see the chart there, the dots, the red dots are the kids, students, I'm sorry, physical distancing. The state's really, really clear. Everybody wears a mask on a bus so they don't ride a bus. There's some specialized circumstances, usually the smaller buses that we operate ourselves, but they really say repeatedly, if the student doesn't wear a mask, you don't have to transport the student. So that's something we'll work through. They have to be assigned seats on the buses. You can do one student per seat. They tell you you can put two siblings in the same seat, but then that tends to impact the seats behind because you can't keep the distancing. So you don't pick up numbers actually with that. Cohorts, they're really clear. If you ride bus 17, that's the bus you ride. 
you can ask to ride bus 18 in the afternoon to go somewhere else. And I know that will be challenging for some of our families. You can choose to ride in the morning, but not in the afternoon. That's manageable because that's the same cohort. You can choose not to ride in the morning and ride in the afternoon if you're the consistent rider. It's just we can't deviate from those groups. There'll be new procedures for getting on and getting off, as you imagine. And again, their ventilation will be an issue and the windows will be open. It's all manageable, but there'll be a whole new series of rules for everybody to adjust to. And finally, the big questions that are still out there. As we all know, these are the heavy duty topics because these are the programs we can kind of work and get them to school for the regular things and home from the regular school, if you will. In general, that's viable for us. But how are we gonna handle sports? Nobody's sure. The governing body, the MIAA, hasn't even made a decision other than it looks like September 14th, I believe was the date or 15th to make a decision. But that I think is very up in the air because how can you practice one set of standards during the day and then suddenly say, hey, it's three o'clock, we're gonna do different things. Clubs activity, after school, before and after school care, we'll have to work through and we'll have a better idea in the next few weeks of what that will look like, but certainly it's too early to make a commitment to certain kinds of programs. So just for our committee, one of the appendices that we'll have is the um, protocols that I handed out to you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our nurse leader, Kristen, has this well in hand with our district nurses, but the state has done a nice job of providing us with various protocols, like if this happens, then you do this. If this happens, then you do that. And uh, I think that's very comforting. So at our next school committee meeting, uh, there'll be a few things to vote on. Just thinking about a policy statement on returning to school, if a person's out on remote first, we need some time to adjust to that. Adjusting the school calendar uh, and, then our, and then our plans. The in-person plan for as many students as possible. As mentioned, our hybrid plan for our grades eight through 12 and our preschoolers and our uh, remote learning plan that combines our um, pre-existing instructional materials with virtual online materials. And that is all we have on that. So I will stop screen sharing and turn it over to you, Madam Chair. There we go, just had a little technical difficulty there. All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I already saw it this morning as part of the task force. So I will uh, go right to comments, questions from school committee members, members of the public crew on this call. Um, I will we'll be entering public comment later in the call. So um, Brian Carey, please, is your hand up? You can unmute. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Ken, Carol, and the staff that presented this. Um, I, I think for me, one thing that I want to start out with is, and, and I've taken several notes that I'm going to heck my way through, but communication is key, not only um, mainly to our parents and, and, and back again, once we find what model we're opening up in. Um, I think communication is a huge thing for our district and, and going forward, not that we have done a bad job, I think we have to continue and increase communication with our families and with the community at large. Um, on another level, I hope that at some point in time, I hope next week we meet in person, um, even if that's a, um, a, a model that some members of the committee meet in person and others meet um, via, you know, remote, remote. Um, I also think at some point we need to set up an executive session meeting where we discuss some of the things moving forward. Um, I think the most, one of the most important things is the physical and mental well-being of our students and our staff. And I think those have to be addressed as we start to move forward. I also think that we have to be very careful and cognizant that you know, what we decide today could be working, um, but tomorrow might be different or next week or next month as we move through this whole process. Um, the one thing I, I, I think I heard over and over is that we have guidance and we have 
this and we have that, usually guidance comes without funding. So I am uh, extremely concerned about funding and, and you know what we're being told to do and what we can afford to do or how we're gonna get funding. Um, I think we need to reach out to our towns, our partner towns and tell them that, you know, we might be coming back to you this year. You know, what very few people know about our budget is that we get one shot at it. And we usually are stuck with that funding for that, you know, that whole fiscal year. I think we need to be able to, uh, to go back to our towns and, and request more, uh, more funding for different reasons. Um, I have a lot of concerns and questions about how our buildings are clean and um, how they're locked and secured during the off school hours. And, I, and I'm sure this is something that Ken and the staff are working on, but at the end of a school day, quite often normally, our schools are left somewhat open to wandering the halls, if you will. And if a hall, a room is, or a section is clean, we have to make sure that that section gets locked down. And once it's sanitized and clean, that nobody enters that until, you know, the next morning when students arrive um, or staff arrives and, and we quickly fill up. Um, I, one question I do have that I think can be answered in eight through 12, which we're being told we don't have enough room and we have to have some kind of remote learning. Can we look at modulars or trailers to help um, fill in some of that space so it's more we're more flexible? Um, and and Ken, you can answer it later on. Um, one thing that did came up is um, is making and I and is technology and how to help parents move through that. I think we need to start building a video library of how tos so that parents can not necessarily email questions, they can go to this video library and look for answers before they start e emailing. And I think that's part of the communication um, key. Um, one of the things that, that DY is great at is obviously the education that the students receive, but also it's everything else that goes with it. And we cannot lose sight of our music, our athletics, and our extracurriculars. I understand that certain things might not be possible, but we have to find a way of engaging our students educationally, but also bringing those other strong points together so that um, we teach the whole student and we find ways of making it happen. And it's not gonna be easy. There's no test model out there for this, but I think um, all of those things need to be considered. I think students need to be playing instruments somehow or another. I think students need to find a different athlete, uh, uh, a different sport. If they can't play X, then they need to be funneled to another sport. Um, and, and we need to engage all of our students as quickly as possible coming out of this. Cause we lost connection, I think with a lot of students from, you know, the middle of March to the middle of June. And, uh, we need to, to reinvent that ourselves and come out stronger than this. So I know that was a lot, um, but I think that's where I stand. I, I look forward to next week's meeting. Um, I wanna listen to what other people have to say and see how we move forward. But um, I also think we need to get our kids back in their buildings safely with staff. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Brian Sullivan, please. In there? Yep, there you are. All right, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the opinion that here that even the best laid plans are gonna run into some troubles. Um, none of this has ever been attempted before. I think Carol mentioned it earlier, and I think I cannot stress this enough. There has to be flexibility. The word guidance literally means advice. So some of the advice we may find useful some of it may be troublesome, but we're not gonna know what it is until we do it. Um, it's, it's really gonna be putting the airplane together when we're flying because nobody's ever tried this before. 
So I want to, I just want to say um, I'm fully in favor of bringing the kids back. I think it's re unbelievably important for them um, as children to grow and learn and, and, and be in school. Um, I'm very concerned with um, the, the social service side of it. I know that calls to DCF are down 50%. And that's not because our kids are being abused 50% less. Um, so um, I'm a very strong advocate of bringing the kids back. Um, but I know that we're going to have some difficulties. Some of these, some of the guidance here may fit into the mold in Boston, but we're a long way from Boston. Um, nothing here happens like it happens in the city. So we have to take that advice, use it the best we can, decide what works, what doesn't work, and then do the best we can with what we have. Um, obviously, probably not going to get any more money for it. Um, I don't know what the state budget's going to look like. I think that's probably going to be problematic in the future as well. So not only are we going to have less money, but we're going to need more money. So um, that's all I have for now. Um, good job, everybody. I think you guys are doing a great job. I know this is very difficult. Um, I'd also like to meet in person. Um, I think it's definitely important as a signal to our community that if the kids can go back to school um, in person, then we, we can meet in person. So that's where I am right now. I noticed we have like 180 people in this meeting, so that may have been difficult tonight, but um, you know, I, we eventually we're going to have to do this live. So that's what yeah. And, and actually, I'll just address that quickly. Um, both since both of you mentioned meeting in person, um, I had a constraint tonight, a time constraint, and also um, the I was trying to avoid disrupting the lunch setup in the cafeteria there um, because it means them taking everything down, cleaning, bring us back in, putting everything back up for the lunch staging there. Um, and as you said, we were going to have to limit the number of people who could be in the room in the chairs. And obviously with 160 people, that would be tough. So yeah. I am fully in support of us meeting in person. There were some logistical constraints this week, but it's not because I don't want to be meeting in person. So absolutely. Uh, Joe Glenn, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to piggyback on uh, and echo what both the Brian said. Um, we, is especially in regards to uh, the funding and um, the extracurriculars, um, I think that the culture that we're going to be teaching the kids in the school and reinforcing uh, during the day can be used um, with the extracurriculars. I know that we're going to have to deal with the governing bodies, um, but we as Brian Sullivan just said, uh, we're a unique district, we're a unique uh, uh, demographics, we're unique in a lot of different ways. And this is new to everybody. Um, the presentation was great, we understand that. I think the teachers understand that, the students understand that, the, the community understands that. And uh, in regards to that funding, um, not just going back to the towns, but going back to the the community as a whole, um, because this is unique in the sense that our whole community is involved in this, uh, unlike any other thing that we ever do. Sometimes there's a budget issue, um, and there are certain people in the community that are involved. This has to do with the, the health, the education, the dollars of everybody in the community, but for our all survival. Uh, and everybody has those uh, their own personal um, situation that they have to deal with. Um, but that also gives an opportunity for our community to be involved, to talk to our elected officials and say, you know, we, we signed and we endorsed uh, unanimously as a school committee to, um, to sign that letter to say that we want funding that we don't want any unfunded mandates. We gotta, we gotta keep that promise and ask our community to do it because otherwise we, we will be going back to the towns like Brian Carey said. Um, but we're all on the same starting line um, and that's an opportunity too. Uh, Dennis Yarmouth is the same as any other district, any other um, community. We're all starting at the same thing. 
And there's no reason why we can't be the best. It gives us an opportunity because we're at that starting line to do it. Some of the decisions that we already made or we held back on um, were wise decisions because we knew that there were gonna be changes and we're changing on the fly. Um, but every district, every school, every school committee, parent, teacher, administration, we're all at the start and that has anxiety. Uh, we're all gonna have some anxiety, but there's excitement here too. The kids wanna get back, you know, we, when we were all kind of locked down, uh, people, the adults wanted to get back and see their friends. And we've learned a lot because of that. We've learned uh, in our community how important it is uh, to connect with people. People that we didn't even think liked us were happy to see us. Um, so there's a lot of good things that come about this. It's a, it's a great presentation. I know that our district is doing all the things that we can do. We have an opportunity for leadership and we need to look forward to the positive lessons. The kids can learn as part of that culture. They can have stickers on their mask and face coverings and, and learn positive things like we do with fire drills and, and all kinds of stuff. So uh, as a school committee, we have to look at the 10,000 foot view and create a policy. Uh, I will be waiting till next week to ask those specific questions um, but we can just all be a, a voice of uh, reason or even the ears of reason to listen to our community, listen to our parents. Uh, hopefully we get uh, information from the teachers um, and we can all be cogs in this wheel. Um, and hopefully if you, if your way isn't the, if it doesn't go the way that you want it, um, you can be a wrench in the, and throw a wrench into the works, but that's not gonna help your way either. So if we all cooperate and we go on, uh, we'll, this could be a very positive thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Joe Tierney, please. Jenny, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to thank Carol and her staff, the administration, especially the, the principals. They've been working tirelessly on this. Um, for probably you know four or five weeks and a lot of parents don't see that background the wheels have been moving and they've been constantly meeting and meeting and meeting daily um, if not twice a day to try to come up with something um and like joe glenn said this is the this is this is the start we're, you know we're all at the starting gate um you know in the news we saw you know barnstable falmouth come out with their preliminary plans which are all good there might have been a little bit more detail but you know once you set that detail in place it, then you may have to adjust the week after. So I think, you know, doing going this way um, with a preliminary plan and then having us come back next week and vote on something a little bit more tighter um, is a good plan because, you know, we can, it gives them the time, the administration to, to look at the survey and, and to see what the, the pe people want and the students and the parents want and the teachers. Um, I'm also in favor of getting as many people back into the classrooms as safely as possible. And, you know, um, again, since the beginning of this, this has been a fluid situation. So, you know, what we're planning on doing today may be totally different uh, next week. You know, the numbers are kind of creeping up and down. So we may have to adjust again. We might have to adjust again at the end of, at the end of August. So, um, you know, parents need just to kind of, you know, realize that things may change and may change one way or another. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, about, uh, you know, the, I was glad to see the commissioner reduced it to 170 days versus 180 days. Um, that also we we're gonna be taking attendance um, as part of this plan. Is the, is the commissioner is in the DESE, I know they tied some funding to attendance. Will that be put against us? You know, because if, if say if one student, you know, shows symptoms, that one's gonna be out or maybe there might be a whole classroom that's out. And, you know, if your attendance is at 60% versus 80 or 90%, I, I don't want to get, I don't feel that any district should be penalized because of that, because of what we're in. Um, so that's something that, that I'd like to like to see. And um, just about also the special education um, part of it, you know, the students that have special education IEP plans and, and things like that, um, we need to make sure that they're serviced also and make sure that they're, they're being looked after. So I think that's an important piece that we need to take into account. But um, again, I, it's, this is this is uncharted territory and it's uncharted territory for parents and for teachers and for administration. So 
um, I commend you guys again for um, for working hard on this, and you know I'll I'll uh, look forward to see what we can come up with next week and um, go from there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Um, Jim Dykeman, did you have anything? Yes, I do. Uh, first, I'd like to piggyback what has been said. The major issue, things I think are the most important thing to me is the safety of the staff and the students. And I also think it's imperative that we not only pursue talking to the towns, but I think we should talk to our state legislators at the, both the state and the federal level to pursue additional funding because it definitely is additional cost. And hopefully we've got it segregated so that we know what it's costing us and we can pursue that, that at the state and federal level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil Morris, anything? Just a brief word of re relating to communications. Uh, every, everybody's touched upon it in various ways. Uh, and I think one of the things in order to stay ahead of the curve of changes, publicity, uh, social media, not just little inserts and, and praise on uh, Facebook. There's enough to praise when you look and watch the reaction from the Dennis Selectman as Ken and Carol made a presentation about uh, uh, the COVID response. Uh, they could see that there was a lot of work done and a lot of prep. And one of it was all the list of documents and legislation that's coming down the line. One of the unfunded mandates problem that we've had over the years is that suddenly we have a need to spend more on a program or a, or a concept. And we have a pushback from local events and local meetings. Uh, so the more we publicize it in a way that works, uh, a eyeballing the some of the news from other school districts. Some of them are not at this level yet. Some of them are more financially in shape and can don't have to. They, they can afford to hire a few more staff or a few more buses. We're uh, we're, we're beholden to the community, and we've built up our positive reputation with good scores, good kids, good activities. So we don't want to lose any of that by somebody not understanding what we're doing. So uh, I concur, concur with my colleagues on that. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the committee? Okay, we are going to, Carolyn, kind of that's okay with you, move to public comment now? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanna remind you, remind everyone here that this is a meeting of a governmental body at which members of the body deliberate over public business. Uh, we do allow um, this public comment at the end or at, today it's at the end for you to um, comment on items within our scope of responsibilities. So please understand this is not a question and answer session. You will be given three minutes to make your comments um, we have a lot of people in here. People are already raising their hands. I'm gonna go down the list. Please use the tool at the bottom of your, top of your Zoom to raise your hand. I can't look through all these screens. Please use the tool to raise your hand. I will go down the list in order. You will have three minutes to speak. Again, this is not question and answer. Um, if you have questions that can't be answered tonight, we will, the right person will get back to you or I, ex would ask you please to send that person an email. All the district email addresses are available on the website. Thank you. I'm gonna start with Wendy Vieira, please. My hand wasn't up on purpose. I didn't know it was up, sorry. Okay, excellent. I will put your hand down. Thanks. Um, Elizabeth, you had your hand up, is that correct? Okay. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I am the mom of a soon to be second grader. Um, I have asked her opinion on returning to school and she is honestly sad because everybody will be wearing masks and she's a hugger. She wants to hug Mrs. Caldwell. She wants to hug her friends. Um, I am totally all for social connection and, you know, being together. I feel like it's hugely, hugely important. I'm a social worker. Um, 
but my you know my concern for her is she's going to see all the people she loves and she's not going to be able to give them a high five or a hug or you know share toys um and then not only that i mean personally for her she has one um kidney so i'm morally moving toward keeping her home um and hoping that perhaps the school committee or whoever could perhaps provide um parents with an in-home <clears throat> curriculum so they're not on the screen um instead you know it's something that i or her father could physically teach her uh while she is home until we do feel safe enough for her to return uh to emmy small so i really appreciate everybody and all the comments um i just i just thought maybe i'd throw that out there if that's a possibility uh she loves Emmy Small, and we're happy that she's there. But also, obviously, we have our concerns. You know, she's our baby girl. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michelle Dunn, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I won't share my screen because I'm reading. I'm Michelle Dunn, fifth grade teacher at Wixon, president of BYEA. Earlier today, I shared two documents with members of the school committee, a set of proposals for safe reopening from MTA, AFT, and DTU, the three largest educators unions in the state, and a statement on returning the school from the MTA executive board. Both were recently endorsed by the BYEA by votes of 97% to 4% on very well-attended membership meetings on Zoom. Our district has already made decisions in the best interest of everyone. First, to go with the six feet of distance endorsed by the CDC and others instead of the three feet. Jesse thinks is okay, and requiring masks for all students K through 12 instead of the 3 through 12 allowed by Jesse. There's still work to be done, such as independent inspections of our buildings to ensure that HVAC concerns have been addressed. Regarding the sound reopening plan, I've heard Barnstable's plan mentioned. Um, they have got it on their website, and it was shared with their staff last Friday and with families two days ago. The BPS is committed to the type of phased-in return that educators statewide are advocating for. They will not return until September 14th, using that time for extended planning and TV. They will return remotely for two weeks, providing time educators need to check in with students and families to assess students' academic levels, their social and emotional health, and their family needs. They plan to return to in-person learning on September 28th. This will give them time to get well past the Labor Day holiday, and by September 28th, we should know if the Cape has dodged the tourist COVID bullet. In addition, Barnstable students will work remotely every Wednesday to allow for deep cleaning midweek, a step taken by other school districts as well. Barnstable will not return full-time at first. They will return half-time. Um, this will, we, we know that public health officials have told us that the more contact we have people with people, the longer exposure we have, the higher the risk of getting COVID. We have no idea what's gonna happen when we put five or 600 people in a building for six or seven hours. So what Barnesville has decided to do is see what happens if we're together for three or four hours. If everything goes well, they will return to full days on October 13th. Throughout these phases, Barnesville will use public health benchmarks to determine if they are ready to move into the next phase. This approach mimics what Governor Baker has done successfully in our state. Successful states and countries have reopened using a gradual, phased in cautious approach and DY should as well and successful communities have based decisions on data. DUI prides itself on being a data-driven district. We must set public health benchmarks and use public health data to guide us in reopening if we are to ensure a safe and successful return to in-person learning. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Heidi Ames, please. Thank you. I'll be brief. I was really, really happy to hear that um, several members of the school committee want to meet in person um, rather than on a Zoom. Um, I kind of have a saying that I never would ask my students to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And so, um, you know, all of our committees that have been meeting, several of which I'm on, they're all meeting on Zoom also. Uh, I know that in each building, I just had perhaps um, a suggestion in each building, there's at least one classroom that um, has been set up for physical distancing as kind of a model. And that perhaps if you were able to meet in, um, in that classroom, I'm not sure how it would work with like outside people coming in, you know, with the masks, of course, and so forth, that that would also give parents an opportunity to see um, what these classrooms actually might look like 
because I, I was really intrigued by the data from the surveys and um, many people are undecided. And I think part of the indecision is that they're not really sure, you know, what it was going to A, look like, and then B, what, what the, you know, what it was just going to, how many kids, that kind of thing. And maybe if you were to meet in a classroom, um, more people could see that and it might help their decision. I don't know, but that's just a thought I had, but I was really happy that you all want to meet in person. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, a person with a phone number, I don't know the name, has their hand raised, 508-375-3378. Anybody? All right, please raise your hand if you'd like to address the committee. I don't see any, Jenny. Yeah, I'm scrolling through the screens just to make sure, but. All right, I'm very surprised. Hey, Jenny, quick comment. It's yeah, Brian please, Kay. yeah. I think Ms. Ames brings up a really good point. Maybe we could take pictures or video tape one of the classrooms um, with what it's going to look like. I know we probably can't meet there because of we have to video. We want to videotape our our meetings, but I think showing what a classroom would look like is a really good idea. Yeah, actually, um, today or yesterday, I forget which day it was. I already asked Ken if we could do a video. Um, of riding the bus and entering school and sitting in the classroom so that everybody could see a what it looks like and b to Heidi's point that we we're all w willing to do it ourselves so um, absolutely yep uh, again I see a hand up from a phone number five zero eight three seven five three three seven eight if that's you please speak up nope I guess not all right. Joe Tierney, did you mean to put your hand up? Yeah, Jen, just real quick. Um, I, I also think we should meet next week if possible in person. I don't know, Ken, if there's a way to set it up to do kind of a Zoom so people want to Zoom in, a Zoom meeting in, something like that where they can make public comment also. Um, kind of like, I guess, want to call it a hybrid meeting um, where you know we can meet in person and people can also interact if they have questions because I think it's important for the, the public to be able to be heard and uh, have their questions, you know, at least heard. Um, so I don't know how that works, but I we'll work on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Joe, Joe Glenn. Yeah. Just to piggyback what Joe just said um, in regards to the in-person, uh, I understand about the message uh, of kind of walking the walk and talking the talk, um, but we are proposing that the people um, not be embarrassed by whatever decision they make. Uh, whether it's a hybrid model or uh, a stay-at-home remote learning uh, thing. So that message uh, we want to send too. So uh, I'm open to anything. Um, we obviously have members that are older um, that are different than the demographic of our students. Um, so that's uh, different also. But I agree with Joe Tierney uh, just said that you, you might want to do uh, uh, a hybrid model. Um, and the other thing is we had, uh, I think, uh, you know, over 150, almost 200 people um, here. I'm surprised also that uh, more people aren't commenting, but maybe they're waiting um, to see more of the details uh, also. And um, so maybe next week um, they're more comfortable to be able to go in and, and um, make comments that they might not have uh, because, you know, we're not going to be able to get 200 or or more people, um, you know, in Station Ave cafeteria. So I think it's an opportunity. And uh, as Brian Carey had said, the communication is important. And um, and the more the people in the community are seeing that, the more that the the more communication we get all around, it's going to be better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, it appears we've gotten through our business this evening. Just one more hand, Jenny. I think it's the person with the phone. And it looked, I don't know if they know, but I think to unmute it starts six. I see the phone. 
Yeah. There. It's Are you the there? 508-375-3378? Yeah, it's Vita Morris. Uh, uh, do you hear me now? We do. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I just, uh, I would like to put forward for your consideration, uh, if you do the in-person meeting next week, that it be done at the Madikis Auditorium, if, uh, if you expect that uh, quite a number of people would be uh, uh, interested in attending. That's one thing. And the other thing is, I'm not certain that I heard correctly, but perhaps it was touched on, but I want to share with you uh, my early education in Europe. And the, the setup was where the students were assigned to a particular room. They spent the entire day in that room, and it was the teachers who kept coming in and out of the room to, to give their lessons. And I think that's not only for this uh, particular situation, but I think the b uh, business of not having uh, students meandering through the hallways between classes also uh, helps to eliminate some of the uh, uh, problems that occur while they were doing while they're doing that. So that would be, uh, I think, a model you might want to consider doing. And uh, 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 that, that's just for your consideration. Okay. I'm sorry. I kept pressing uh, star nine before. That was for the selectmen, and and they, you know, uh, but apparently, uh, uh, the, it all worked out okay. That's, no worries. Thank you. Thank. Okay. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. All right. I don't see any more hands up. I would entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Stay safe.